Who gave public lectures in squares that drew thousands of people? Who contributed to the invention of the geocentric model and invented the astrolabe? Who was beaten to death by Christian zealots wielding roof tiles and then torn apart and burned? One of the greatest and earliest female mathematicians, Hypatia of Greece. Hypatia's father, Theon, was a mathematician and a member of the ancient library of Alexandria. The ancient library of Alexandria was located in the northern coast of Egypt before its destruction in 650 AD. This state may be subject to controversy as many historical records from that time were lost or biased. Because Hypatia's father was so influential in the library, Hypatia had access to many texts and famous works that gave her the tools to become a prominent figure in Greek history. Many people consider her the last head librarian of the library. Beyond spending time in the library, Hypatia was the head of the Neoplatonism school at, the Al at Alexandria and taught philosophy and astronomy as well as contributing to studies in mathematics. She and her father collaborated often on various texts and projects that are still influential today. Neoplatonism is a school of thought where practitioners believe that everything is controlled by the One. The One is an unknowable substance that is the creator and destroyer of all things. Neoplatonists were heavily influenced by Plato, the famous Greek philosopher. Famous Neoplatonists include Emperor Julian of Rome, Plotinus, and Simplicius of Cilia. Neoplatonism still exists in modern forms and has, a, has been applied to mathematics, such as Plato's theory of mathematical and abstract objects. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Philip K. Dick, and Goethe are more modern examples of famous Neoplatonists. Hypatia's biggest contribution to mathematics was her invention of the astrolabe. The translation of this word is literally star taker, from the Greek word astron, meaning star, and Labian planet. It was also useful in determining local time and latitude. The astrolabe consisted of a large disc called a mater, which comes from the Greek word for mother. The mater usually was made of brass and was six inches wide. The mater contained a depression so that one or more plates could rest on top of it. The rim of the mater, or the limb, had two scales on it, an inner one for measuring hours of the day and an outer one for measuring degrees. Several smaller discs, called tympans, rested on the mater. Each tympan was used to measure a certain latitude in the sky, meaning that an astronomer at one latitude would need to use a different tympan than an astronomer at another. On each tympan were markers of alchemators and azimuths, or latitude and longitude. A reedy held everything together and allowed the discs to rotate freely. The reedy was marked with a number of important stars and constellations and was held in place by a pin, which represented the North Pole. As the reed rotated around the central pin, it showed the daily movement of celestial bodies. Some astronomers attached the alidade to the back of their astrolabes, which allowed them to measure the altitude of stars and planets. How can you use an astrolabe to tell time? One. First, find a reference star. In ancient times, they would have u likely used Procyon, the eighth brightest star in the sky. Two, next, find the altitude of the star. Attach a short length of rope through the ring at the top of the astrolabe. Hold the rope so that the instrument is hanging vertically, turning the astrolabe so it has it's pointing at its target. Then rotate the alidade until the object lines up both ends of the dial. You can now read the altitude of Procyon using an outer scale that measures at elevation. 3. Find the position of the sun on the target date by using the alidade on the back. Turn the dial until you reach the day. There will be a corresponding zodiac scale as well. 4. Turn the astrolabe over to the back of the instrument and find Procyon on the reedy. Rotate the reedy so that the target star on the reedy matches the altitude of the star. 5. Find the time, rotate the rule a clock-like hand until it touches a specific zodiac date. The time will be on the outer ring. 6. Congratulations! You have now measured the time successfully as you would have in ancient Greece. Another one of Hypatia's contributions to mathematics include the geocentric model. While today we know that this model is incorrect, during that time it was considered up-to-date and mathematically sound. In ancient Greece, the geocentric model was a model of the solar system where all the planets, stars and suns, and other celestial bodies rotated around the Earth. Two observations contributed to this theory. Firstly, that celestial bodies appear to rotate around the Earth from an Earthbound observer, and that the Earth appeared stable and at rest. 
Hypatia lived a very interesting life, especially near the end of it. She never married. According to one work written about her, the Byzantine Suda, she remained a virgin her whole life and rejected suitors by waving her menstrual rags at them, proving that there was nothing beautiful about carnal desire. Said once by an Egyptian Coptic, John of Nikyu, she was devoted to all times to magic, astrolabes and instruments of music, and she beguiled many people through her satanic wiles. Probably the most famous and interesting thing about Hypatia was her death. To get into her death, we need a little background. During 415 AD, there was a conflict over Jews in Alexandria dancing in courtyards. The Roman governor of Alexandria, Orestes, published an edict to establish new guidelines to these dances because he was unhappy the dancing exhibitions attracted large crowds and led to varying degrees of disorder and conflict. The edict angered both Christians and Jews. One such Christian, a monk named Hyrax, read the edict, and while in support of the edict, many people believe he attempted to cite the crowd into anarchy. Orestes, hearing of this, became jealous that the crowd was in support of Hyrax, and in his delirious rage, tortured Hyrax. Cyril, the bishop of Alexandria, heard that Hyrax was tortured by Orestes. At the time, Hyrax was one of Cyril's followers and Cyril decided to retaliate by threatening the Jews of Alexandria. The Jewish people, realizing that Cyril wished to retaliate, lured Christians into the courtyard by saying their church was burned and killed them. Out of revenge, Cyril stopped, stripped the Jews of their belongings and banished them from Alexandria. This made Orestes unhappy and encroached on his power. Cyril and Orestes both wrote to the emperor of Rome out of anger. Through this, 500 monks heard of this news and arrived in Alexandria. They captured Orestes' chariot, and a monk named Ammonius bashed Orestes over the head with a rock. Ammonius was killed for his crime, and in response, Cyril ordered that Ammonius become a martyr. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, where does Hypatia fit in this story? Orestes asked Hypatia for advice during the feud. Because of this, a mob of Christian monks went to looking for Hypatia, led by Peter the Magistrate. Upon finding her, they dragged her into the street, stripped her, beat her to death with the roof tiles, tore apart her body and burned and buried the remains. After Hypatia's death, Cyril was named the new Theophilius, and the last of the pagan idolatry was expelled from Alexandria. In other words, Hypatia had very little to do with this feud, but suffered much more than anybody else. But her contributions to mathematics are still remembered today. The moral of this story, make sure when you offer somebody advice, a mob of angry Christians will not tear apart your body.